So I was doing musical theatre. I've been doing musical theatre for seven years. I had taught on musical theatre. I'd set up my own business doing handmade cards. So everybody always rolls up with it. This is my example of my manual dexterity yeah. <laughs> that I put together. And I think for me, my strength was that as much as I hadn't been pursuing a career in dentistry, when I did come down to putting that statement together, I did have a lot of skills from other areas that naturally lent to that lent themselves to the career. Yeah. So I think those were definitely my strengths. Okay, so welcome guys to another episode. Uh, my name is Arnold and um, today we've got Dr. Safako Ayaku, who is going to be telling us about her dental journey um, and what she's up to as a dentist um, today. So she qualified from Liverpool, so we're going to be finding out all about that and um, all that she's doing in terms of um, working with other dentists and even mentoring um, other dentists will get into all of that. So thank you for coming on today. You're welcome. It's a, such a pleasure to jump onto someone else's page. <laughs> the roles have been reversed. Yeah, this is a new position for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always like to start with the question of why would you um, decide to become a dentist? Why would you put yourself through this torture? <laughs> so, um, I think I'm quite different to most dentists. Yes. I meet lots of dentists and they wanted to be a dentist since whenever, since they were three or five or 12, or since they had ortho. Most people have like a, an origin story as to where that impetus comes from. It from. My story is a lot more dry <laughs> than that. Um, I had, well, anybody who follows me will know that I have lots of diverse interests. I'm into music, I'm into performing arts, I'm into lots and lots of different things. And so initially I'd wanted to do performing arts and my mom told me like a true African parent, don't be silly, you'll die hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do, do law and I was advised that I was probably a little bit too emotionally involved in people yeah. to be a good lawyer. I then wanted to do clinical psychology. Again, I was told you probably die hungry. Um, not that I think any of these things are true, but <laughs> that's what I was told at the time. Was it family um, or friends? Who are the voices? Family. Family. family and wider family. Because so my my parents are doctors, my grandparents are in healthcare. We are a very medical, high achieving family. And like most Ghanaians, lots of West Africans in general, that I you have a couple of options. Medicine. <laughs> medicine law or something to do with finance generally speaking or business if you're particularly that way inclined yeah. so you have broadly speaking four options and none of my options really fitted into any of those things and so I guess the advice that I was given was to try and pick one of those four but preferably one that you're that you're naturally inclined to yeah um so I decided in the end that I would follow in my forefather's footsteps and I would do medicine unless I could think of something better yeah. And so I obviously my parents being doctors, work experience and that kind of stuff was really easy. And then a couple of weeks before UCAS closed, our school had an kind of, I guess, a careers fair, but it was a careers day. So they had lots of past students from the school come in and talk about their careers. And I met this girl. She was feisty. She seemed to have a life. Yeah. outside of work she didn't she was doing max facts at the time but apart from her max facts job she didn't work night she didn't work evening she didn't work weekends she didn't have a bleep and she still seemed to be doing all right for herself and so in my mind I thought huh okay something that's better than medicine that's almost kind of medicine I'll do dentistry so I actually made the decision to do dentistry very very late on in the game okay and in so hindsight, how late was this you, you said um, you passed just passed the deadline? Um, no, it was probably, so the deadline's what, the end of September? So we were probably talking about the June before okay. UCAS applications for dental school closed. So very, 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 very close. Gosh, okay, so you and made that decision. Like, Sorry? It wasn't even like I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm desperate to be a dentist. I was like, eh. That, that's, a, that's a smart move because I'd see my parents do on calls and be bleeped in at stupid o'clock whilst they're having dinner. And I just thought, I don't have to have a bleep and I don't have to work nights. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I've got the grades. Cool, I'll do that. So that work-life balance is a big thing for you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Most definitely. What, what, what are the next steps when you made that decision? You've had that conversation, you've started dentistry. What did you start doing? Um, I had to scrap together some dental work experience. <laughs> Um, and so we have a family friend who owned a dental practice. He's very old school. I love him to pieces. And he just said, come and sit with me for a week. And so I literally just sat by his chair and he explained to me all kinds of weird and wonderful things. I think I actually had some very, very good work experience yeah. in terms of understanding what day to day dentistry was like. And then that summer I was in Ghana. And again, we have family friends who work in the medical and dental school there. So I went okay. to the medical and dental school there and spent a day kind of shadowing on clinic well out of my depth. I had no idea <laughs> what was going on, but it was enough for me to make it at least look on my personal statement that I had been trying and that I really wanted to do it. So, so for me, it was about cobbling together the appropriate work experience to actually viably apply and not make it look like I just thought, ah, oh, okay, I'll tick that box. How hard could it be? So is that, was that a um, common trip for you going back to Ghana? Were you born in Ghana? Um, or were you born in England? I was born in England, but yeah. I I live between both continents. I think this, because of lockdown, this is the longest period in my living memory that I've not yeah. been to Ghana. <laughs> I go all the time. I when I, my my friends joke that I just like study and work in England. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have Ghana. your life in Ghana. <laughs> yeah, Christmas, summer, Easter. Sometimes we used to go for half terms. Back yeah. when flights were cheaper and you could act, that was actually a viable option. But so I, I, I do tend to go back home a lot. So um, how, how did you find um, the application process in terms of putting together a personal statement, in terms of um, interviews? How did that process, how did that part go for you? So the personal statement, we were, we were actually doing a Spanish exchange program. So I was actually writing my personal statement whilst we were in Spain in like a Spanish <laughs> language class. Um, I was only one of two people in my school who were applying for dentistry, but we were really lucky. We had this amazing, amazing careers tutor called Miss Juniper. She's worth her weight in gold. And I would write a version and she would email it back and I'd write another version and she would email it back. Um, I think for me, the challenge was because at the point that I was submitting my personal statement, I didn't have as much work experience as much as some of the other candidates did. I guess I kind of made up for that in the fact that I had work experience in the medical field. So I'd been in, I spent about two to three weeks in GP practices and hospitals because of my parents in kind of observership roles. Yeah. But I think trying to stay, trying to stay within the word count and picking what was relevant is always the hardest part of your personal yeah. statement because your your grades get you through the door but then your personal statement is what gives you the interview yeah. and i found this um i sat on the interview panel for liverpool at one point and on paper lots of people look the same and i think the challenge is how how to stand out but how to do that in a genuine way right, yeah because the there are, lot, there are lots of things that every, everybody's got community service. Everybody's done dental work experience. Everybody's, everybody's a do-gooder and has gone above and beyond to make their CV and their personal statement look shiny. And so I think for me, the challenge was to be like, okay, I have done all of these things, but what things, whittling down what things are most pertinent to this application yeah. and then which things are unique to me and making sure that I include those things. Well, when, you, when you look back at your personal application, if you know, let's say you were the admissions tutor interviewing yourself or just looking over your own application, what, what do you think were your strengths and what do you think were some weaknesses that you could probably improve on? Mm, that's a good question. I think, I think my strength, it's going to sound weird, I think my strength was that I wasn't all about dentistry. Okay. And that I had, a, I think I had, because I had a broad, a broad breadth of experiences across different fields and lots of interests and things that I'd invested lots of time and hours in, not just to make my CV look good, but because I was really passionate about those things. I think because, because I had such diversity in the things that I was talking about, I think that definitely worked in my it, favor. It wasn't a tick box exercise for you. You were doing things you were genuinely passionate about. Yeah. 
So I was doing musical theatre. I'd been doing musical theatre for seven years. I had taught on musical theatre. I'd set up my own business doing handmade cards. So everybody always rolls up with it. This is my example of my manual dexterity yeah. <laughs> that I put together. And I think for me, my strength was that as much as I hadn't been pursuing a career in dentistry, when I did come down to putting that statement together, I did have a lot of skills from other areas that naturally lent to that lent themselves to the career. Yeah. So I think those were definitely my strengths. I think my weakness was that I didn't know much about dentistry in terms of the career, what it looked like. I had very limited understanding and experience of it at the point that I put in my application. Mm. Fortunately, because, because you said you had the work experience, you shadowed. So what, what, why mm. do you think it wasn't a deep enough insight? So I think looking from being on an interview panel and being on the other side, yeah. I just look at some of the, I look at some of the students who came through and I think like wow like you you really really want this like you yeah. really really <laughs> really want to do this and and they they had dug the interesting I think being on the interview panel I felt felt a little bit like a fraud to begin with <laughs> because I thought like wow like they have they have invested so much time to specifically to specifically pursue this career and understand they'd done a lot more reading than I had done at the point of my application they knew what root canal was I had a vague idea but I didn't really understand anything about it but here I was five years down the line interviewing people who could tell me about different files and I was thinking gosh I learned that stuff in dental school I didn't have I didn't have a clue about those things and so I think if I think if I had been put in front of a a panel of interviewers who had favored that and they favored very highly people who had invested that time yeah. that could have that could have worked against me fortunately it didn't I got into dental school but looking back I think looking at some of the students who I have interviewed I'm like wow you you were a lot more passionate about this career from the outset than mm -hmm. I was and to a certain extent I I, th I had made an intellectual decision that dentistry was the right career for me yeah. But I didn't have this grand vision of one day I'm going to be a dentist and I, I didn't have that. And I think when you are sat side by side with people who are the same as you on paper and yeah. they have that fire, that's always going to be a disadvantage. How, how would you advise somebody to get that sort of deep insight into dentistry then? How, how would somebody go about gaining that? I would say speaking to dentists outside of their clinics okay. gives, gives a lot of deep insight because we've all done it. When, when someone sat beside you and you're trying to do your work, you, will, you can explain technically what you're doing, the importance of it. And you obviously want to give the person the best experience of being in your practice with you as you possibly can. But I think when you take, us as dentists away from our patients and away from our tools and you ask us what our careers are like a lot of us speak we don't give a one-dimensional story we'll say yeah we love this we love that we love that but actually these are the real nitty-gritty challenges where if you're on a busy day and you're working 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 trying to get the patients through trying to get everything boxed off you don't necessarily have the time to have those more honest and insightful conversations because as we all know dentistry it's fantastic. I love my career, but it's also can sometimes be really stressful. <laughs> and sometimes you think being a dentist is the bane of my life yeah. and it's, and it's all things. And I think sometimes if you're do, just doing work experience in a clinic, especially with somebody who you don't already have a pre-existing relationship with, yes. you can sometimes get lots of clinical and technical knowledge and exposure without understanding kind of, I guess all the stuff around that, the impact that being a dentist has on your life, what working in a high pressure time driven situation all day, every day yeah. looks like, what holidays look like, what rest looks like. And I think that that is really important to understand and to be going in with both eyes open that <laughs> this, this is what I am getting myself into. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's so true. And, and that's actually good that you put it that way, getting the dentist out at, outside of the clinic and then you can really get um, those deep insights. Tell, tell, talk to us about dental school. So did you get the one offer for Liverpool and you know after you got your offers how did you pick dental school and what was dental school like? Yeah so I got I applied to four universities I applied to Cardiff, King's College, 
Liverpool and Manchester. Um, I got a flat out rejection from Manchester, um, which knocked my confidence quite significantly. Um, I now know that there were some interesting things going on in terms of how they were recruiting that year and that it wasn't necessarily to do with just my application, but there were other factors at play. Um, but I kind of, you know, when you put something in and you get an auto error message, I kind of got that feeling from Manchester that I like submitted my form and I was like, error, error, <laughs> we don't want you. And so I, I found that quite, quite stressful. Hmm. Then I then had three interviews. So I interviewed at Kings, Cardiff and Liverpool. Um, the Cardiff interview was so chilled and laid back. I didn't, I, I wasn't too sure whether it was a pre-interview chat. Um, <laughs> I went to step I could go. I was a little bit bewildered. I came in and they were like, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> Someone made me a cup of tea. Um, so the Cardiff interview was really lovely and really chill. Kings was intense. Kings was a very, very, very intense interview. And I, again, I walked away not really knowing how I'd done. I'd heard things about what King's interviews were like. And so I, I would, felt I was prepared, but it was like a baptism of fire. It was a really, really hard process. And then Liverpool was somewhere in between hmm. the two of those. Things. Um, so then I then got, I got a, I got a, if we have any space, we'll take you offer from King's. So King's had originally been the place that I'd wanted to go to. And interestingly, I'm not doing my master's at King's. So it's, it's interesting coming full circle that I didn't get, I didn't get in first time, but I'm, I'm there now. Yeah. Um, and then I got an offer, I got unconditional offers from Cardiff and Liverpool. Mm. And again, I think one of the things that swayed me, I went to the guy who I did my work experience with in the first instance, and he said to me, one of the things that he knows about Liverpool graduates is that they're very good at doing their job. Mm. There's lots of patience, there's lots of treatment need in Liverpool. And so his advice was, if you want to come out to be fully equipped, really well knowing how to do your job and dealing with difficult cases, of the two universities you've picked, Liverpool's a really good shout. And when I came here on the, when I came here on the open day, I, I just completely fell in love with the city. So I actually applied to Liverpool as, um, as my backup choice. I kind of went, oh, if I don't get in anywhere, I reckon I'll get, to Liverpool, get into Liverpool. I had lots of preconceptions about what it would be like here. So Liverpool went, went from my fourth choice as I'm like, I should probably be sensible and pick something that's quote unquote easy. Um, but after going through the kind of open day process and the interview process, I was like, no, actually, I want to go to Liverpool because the people are fantastic. They were kind. On the day of my interview, I missed my train. I got lost. I turned up, I think, an hour and 20 minutes late in trainers with a hoodie and a backpack sweating after having power walked around the city. And they were like, it's fine. We've just, like, we've just moved some things around. Take half an hour. Chill. Breathe. And I, I just really liked, I really liked my experience of being with them. Yeah. Um, and again, it was a much more pleasant, pleasant interview. I felt very much at home. So I picked Liverpool and fortunately it met all of my expectations. It is, a, it's an incredible city and I've made, I think the most important thing that I've taken away from Liverpool, apart from an ability to treatment plan, treatment plan cases where things are really difficult. Yeah. And everything's kind of various degrees of destroyed because for a long period, all of my patients were themes and variations <laughs> on that is that it's an incredible university community to be a part of. And I've come through the other side of friends and colleagues who I love and respect and who have got my back. And so for me, the university experience in the whole was, was really, was really quite positive. What, there what wasn't would you say, that much so would you say the strength with Liverpool Uni was the fact that you got a lot of practical experience and very different. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I know not I know not all of my colleagues who graduated with me would agree. <laughs> I think some of I think with, with everything there's variability, but I think that based on the roles that I went to do that I felt reasonably well well equipped. Yeah. God brought a plenty in <laughs> Liverpool. <laughs> If you want to drill holes, you can drill holes. If you need to take you out You weren't difficult... lacking for patients. No, <laughs> no, lacking for patients who turned up. But I, I don't think we ever, we ever lacked for patients. And I think we got a good breadth yeah. of experience, a really good breadth. Because I think in some, I think in Kings, you have a clinical partner system, and I think down in Peninsula, it's very similar. 
So your time on clinic is either you assisting or you treating. Yeah. Whereas in Liverpool, we didn't have that. If you're on clinic, you were treating the patient. And if your patient doesn't turn up, then you'll assist for, I guess, whoever, whoever you feel needs your help the most. Yeah. But um, I think we got, at least when I was there, we got a good amount of clinical time. And I didn't feel like I was splitting that time up between my colleagues because if I was on clinic, I was on clinic seeing my patients. Not were, were you in Liverpool when um, you clan was still twinned with Liverpool? So my the year I started was the first year that the U clan degree started, and so we used to have them beam into our lectures, and there'll be a little box in the corner, yeah. <laughs> U clan students kind of peering in, looking like, oh, who are these Liverpool people? Um, because so by yeah, the time U-Clan. I started at U clan, that had stopped. Now we had completely gone separate from Liverpool, but I, I always heard yeah. that U clan used to tune into to Liverpool, and we still come in first year for the cadavers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was really interesting, and I think there I think there was one exam, I think it was maybe one of the OSCE type exams, like a communication skills, or there was there was something, some there was something that UCLan students came down for, and we were all like, who who are these people? <laughs> the UCLan students, because UCLan is completely grad entry, right? Yes, completely grad entry, um, four year course, um, but a lot of the um, stuff the material the modules would have been based off of liverpool and then afterwards uclan started to make its own curriculum mm. yeah 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 I, I still remember uclan beaming in the lectures. <laughs> so okay how would you um summarize your years in dental school and you know for anybody that's watching about to start at liverpool dental school or any dental school um, what sort of advice would you would you give? Mm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna quote one of the lecturers in this. He said to us in our first year, join the join the Flower Appreciation Society, do the Fandango dance class, do the night calls and all the rest in your first year because I think I did IB, so I think I was quite well prepared for the step up from secondary school to university. But no matter where you're coming at it from, you have more time than you think. <laughs> Make the most of your first year because second year is is a revelation. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I I had a lot. I ha- I have a, had a lot of fun in Liverpool. You will get in as much as you you get out as much as you put in. The yeah. stu- the teachers are fantastic, and they are on your side. And if you feel that there are things that you are struggling with speak up speak up and say so sooner rather than later because liverpool liverpool tutors are very good at getting people the support that they need when they need it in my experience but in your first year get it out your system party go out join every single weird and wonderful association you could ever dream of because by the end of your third week and second year you'll think oh my word (laughs) what was happening before because second year is, I think the step up from first year to second year is the biggest step of all. Okay. You go from doing PBL and occasionally turning up for the odd lecture and a bit of dissection and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you feel that you're busy, but actually you have a lot of free time. Whereas at the beginning of second year in particular, every waking hour is scheduled. You are there all the time. And I remember, I used to remember getting home from uni on a Friday and like kicking off my shoes and climbing into bed and waking up around 8 p.m. and being like, I'm hungry and disappearing out in search of chicken and chips. I was, I was done for by Friday. Yeah. I was exhausted. And then on the other side of it, remember that when you get to the end of your career, fifth year is as much a test of endurance as it is a skill. Yeah. Everything that you're doing is building up to that point. People get really, really stressed and het up about final year. And what if this, what if that? Final year is just a long fourth year. Yeah. And you have to have a strategy about how you're going to tackle that because a lot of it is about endurance and consistency in the same direction. Yeah. It's, it feels like a big step up because it's the end, but it's actually more of an endurance race. And so plan ahead and have a strategy. No, that's good. That's good. 
Um, I think for this segment, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it to, to, to a close. Um, in the next video, we'll be talking all about um, how life was after graduating, qualifying, you know, um, getting into the real world. Uh, we'll find out all about that. So guys, make sure to um, tune in for the next um, episode and subscribe so you always get the notifications about um, all the videos that are coming out. So thank you. And um, we'll see you in the next video.